Boa tarde a todos. Estamos de volta aqui para mais uma palestra, o professor Joseph Hamilton. Antes eu queria anunciar para vocês que essa é uma atividade da escola, com sala de educação física, fisioterapia, fonoaudiologia, terapia ocupacional e tem o apoio da, da Pró-Reitoria de Pesquisa da USP. Além do professor Joe, temos mais 12 professores estrangeiros que vêm para esses programas de pós-graduação da área 21 e eles vêm para ministrar palestras, fazer reuniões com alunos e professores. E hoje de manhã tivemos mais de 1.300 conexões durante a palestra do professor Joe, que está sendo passada pela IPTV online também. Joe, thank you again for coming. And we are all very excited to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you. This particular presentation, um, I initially uh, put it together for me. And for many years, I used to keep this right by my side whenever I was writing to make sure that I kept everything in order when I was writing. And the format for the paper that I'm going to describe to you um, is a particular type of format. And it deals with what is often referred to as empirical research. It's a research study, how to present a research study. And it works also, um, well, most of it will work for even undergraduates who are writing a paper um, that they're going to present. So <clears throat> these are the key points. And as I said, in writing a report or a manuscript, it doesn't matter what the magic what it is. It can be a manuscript, a thesis, a dissertation, an undergraduate project. It's the same. The process is the same. And how you construct the report is the same. Now you may leave out little bits here and there, um, but the first part of it actually will be the same as any other report. Now, I wanted to get this um, explained right away. There's two ways of writing the report. And the report can either be written in the third person or in the first person. For many years, manuscripts that were published could only be written in the third person. It seems now that we're allowing more and more manuscripts to be in the first person. And I'll explain the difference between those two. Um, what was interesting to me was just recently um, we published a paper and part of the paper we made some comments about being in the first person and the editor made us change it to the third person, which I've never had before. But <clears throat> regardless, <clears throat> the key things are that the writing must be clear. <clears throat> If it's not understood, then you've done a poor job. And that will be very clear and very <coughs> obvious when the paper goes through review. And when people start asking you questions and they don't understand what you've said, it means you weren't clear. Okay? So, this is what a first person statement would look like. <clears throat> In our last lecture, Professor Page told us that the vertical jump height was an indirect way of assessing short-term power output. He told me that I would be the participant in the following laboratory practical. The practical demonstrated to us that the power determined from the vertical jump height and power directly determined from a force platform or plate different slightly in the same participant. What makes this the first person is the fact that you have us, he, me, um, us. When you start talking about that, that's the first person. This is becoming much more acceptable. Okay. Now, third person, 
the exact same information would be presented like this. In a previous lecture, Professor Page explained that the vertical jump height was an indirect way of assessing short-term power output. It was also explained that this author would be the participant in the following laboratory practical. And the practical demonstrated that power determined from a vertical jump height and power directly determined from a force play different slightly in the same participant. You know, it's very subtle difference. If you notice in this, there is no us, me, I, nothing at all. And as I said, for many, many years, this was the way you had to write. But the first person is also acceptable now. The key thing is you try not to mix the two. If you write in the first person, the paper should be written in the first person. If you write in the third person, the paper should be written completely in the third person. It doesn't matter now, as I said, both are acceptable. <clears throat> so, what are the general sections of a research paper? <laughs> and this is what you would find, and this is what you have to attend to when you write a paper. The title, abstract, introduction, methods, results, discussion, conclusions, and references. All of that constitute a paper or a manuscript. Okay. <clears throat> now, one of the things that I do when I write, I don't start with the title and just go all the way through. You start, I always start writing the methods first because that's the easiest part. Then I do the results and conclusions, and then I go back and do the introduction. The only part of the introduction that I do before anything else, the only part that I do is I talk about the purpose of the study. Okay. So what we're going to do is go through each one of these, and I'm going to try and tell you what should be in and what you should avoid. And the first thing is talking about titles. And I should mention to you that I am probably the worst at um, generating a title of a paper. So things that you try to do in a title. And the title is very important. And the reason why it's important is because in many, um, you know, when you go into PubMed or you go to Google and you search for a paper, the only thing you'll get is the, the title of the paper. Okay, and so if you want people to read the paper, you have to have a good title. So, whoops. So, things to look for. If you only have a small number of variables, the title should name the variables. So, this paper, the relationship between height and weight, it's obvious what the paper is about. If there's lots of variables, then you try to categorize the variables. So kinematics, there's a lot of variables that could be called kinematic variables. So the kinematics of lower extremity uh, uh, during running. You know what this is about. You don't know the exact kinematic variables, but you know what it's generally about. One of the things that a lot of uh, people make the mistake is you never use a complete sentence in a title. The title is never a complete sentence. Okay? And your title should be concise. What that means is you want a title that is relatively short and concise, you know, meet, meaning. I find a lot of students will do a title like um, something, um, the effect of power output on cycling in men, women, children uh, during uh, a prolonged workout uh, in the daytime and sometimes at nighttime. 
you know, they tell you everything about the, the study. And the title is just too long. It gives way too much detail. Okay? So you try to have a short, concise title. And this is the important thing. It should indicate what was studied, not the results of the study. Okay? So, uh, this is something, um, you know, if the study is strongly tied to a particular model or a theory, you might want to look, call, uh, mention the uh, model and the theory in the title. So, muscle forces during walking, a hill model perspective. A hill model is just a, mo a muscle model. And, um, you know, because it's important, you might want to do this. However, you could just as easily title this paper, Muscle Forces During Walking. <clears throat> Sometimes, and actually all the time, you want to omit the name of the instruments. <laughs> Um, in this particular thing here, Force Platform Measures of Children During Running, that's the actual title of the paper. Um, what you could say just as easily is the kinetic measures of children during walking or during running. Okay? And this is becoming more and more popular is the title of your paper you ask in the form of a question. Do children work harder than adults during walking? So you know what the study's about. Okay? It's going to compare children and adults. It's going to be walking. And it's going to be some measure of work. Okay. Um, I don't particularly like this. I don't like questions in titles, but it is uh, becoming more and more popular. The two words that I absolutely hate in a title, and I think you should try to avoid using, are the effect of, you know, the effect of walking on oxygen consumption, or the influence of walking on oxygen consumption. Those words, they're, in the English language, they're considered very, very weak words. You know, there are better ways of, of saying the same thing. And you try to make your title consistent with a research hypothesis, the objective of the study, or the question you're asking. Okay? Now, as I said, I am absolutely terrible at making titles. And I tell you, one of the things um, that this costs you, as I said, People look up the title and they try to infer what the paper was about because of the title. And if you give something a poor title, no one will read it because they may mistake it for something else. Okay? And I've done that several times and, you know, and people say to me, well, you must have written a paper on this. Well, I did. I just gave it a bad title so you don't know that I wrote it. So, I've spent a lot of time just on the title because it is so critically important. Now, as I told you, I never do everything in a sequence. The title is usually the very, very, very last thing I do. Okay? But it's not, it, it's actually one of the more important things that you will do. So, one of the things, too, is if you have something special about your title, or in your study, you try to use it in the title. In this particular study, um, and again, this is an actual title of a paper, um, chromium was used, and they were trying to look at a chromium supplement, and that was the whole basis of the study, so you put it in the title. Okay? As I said, titles are critically important, so be very, very, very careful in how you construct a title, okay? And this is where your mentor should help you uh, doing this. Um, as I said, you should never ask me, because I'm terrible. Um, now the next thing is the abstract. And this is one of the last things that you'll do. I'm just putting them in a sequence order, 
of the paper itself. And usually the uh, journal that which you're going to submit will have rules. And the rules will tell you how many words you're allowed in the abstract. Okay. Um, most of the time it's 250 words. Sometimes it's as many as 300 words. But one of the things that often happens is if you put too many words, the journal will not accept it. They'll send it back to you. Okay. So you have to look at the journal, find exactly the number of words, and make sure you have the exact number of words in your abstract. So, what you try to do is have one sentence at the beginning of the abstract that describes the general problem area. Okay. So let's say you're going to study um, children and adults and walking. You might start off the abstract by saying, there is considerable disagreement in the amount of work that is done by children and adults during walking. Okay. That just gives, sets the stage. The very next statement would be the purpose of the study. <clears throat> so, that's my introduction um, to the abstract. Then the next sentence would be, the purpose of the study was to. Okay. You might want to say, we hypothesized that. And then, what you have to do is talk very, very, very generally about the methodology. You might only have two sentences, but you have to explain your total methodology in two sentences. And then the most basic thing in the abstract is what were your results? And again, you might only have two sentences to get across all of your results. So what you do is you present only the most important results. And generally the most important results are the results of your statistics, your statistical tests. What was significant? If it's not significant, you generally try to not report it in the abstract. One of the things that's, that you should always do is point out unexpected results, if you have unexpected results. Can I mention, Sandra um, did a paper, and in the paper, she was looking at people with knee osteoarthritis walking up and down stairs. And that was the basis of the paper. But in the paper, when she did the statistical analysis, she found something totally unexpected. She found out that there were two ways people with knee osteoarthritis went up and down stairs. That was unexpected. Okay. And it was mentioned in the abstract, and in fact it became most of the paper, this unexpected result. If you have space, the unique aspects of the study, in, in the case of in Sandra's paper, the unexpected results were the unique aspects of the, the paper. And of course you try to name the theory if it's possible. If there's no theory to it, then just ignore that sentence. Okay? Now, as I said, the abstract is never written first. It's always basically the last thing you do. Uh, and then, of course, you put the title on top of that. So those come near the end. The introduction is very important. It's very important because this is what captures people's attention. You know, and you know, it's like the beginning of a movie. If, if the movie doesn't start out well, you get disinterested in the rest of it. If your paper doesn't start out well, people may not read the rest of it. Okay. So, introduction. <clears throat> in most papers, the literature review serves as an introduction. What you try to do is you're very selective in reviewing only the most important literature. Not everything, 
just the most important. The one thing that I find my students used to do is they would just list references. They would say, so-and-so did this, and then someone else did this, and then someone else did this. That's just not very interesting, and it's not a very good way to write the paper. <clears throat> the way you construct your introduction is it should lead logically to your research hypothesis. You know, you have some general statements, you have some literature review, you may want to put in a paragraph about how this study is different from all others, and then what you say, um, and after pointing out gaps in the literature, you know, then you say, therefore, the purpose of this study was to, that should be the last couple of sentences of your introduction. Okay. So it's a logical progression leading up to therefore. And therefore just means, you know, because of all of this, this is what we do. <clears throat> One of the things that you try to include, and you try to include this through the literature, is the importance of this topic. You know, and then it's especially important to do this because you know you want the person to read the paper. You know, like for example, I'm going to use Sandra's case again. Neoosteoarthritis is a very, very, very big topic, and it's a big topic because it's a once you get neoosteoarthritis, there's no cure. Okay, so. That's an important topic. Because there's no cure, it costs a lot of money. You know, there are billions of dollars in the US spent on knee osteoarthritis, and there is no cure. So that's something that you can point out in a paper on knee osteoarthritis. If there's a theory involved, then you discuss it. But a lot of times, you don't necessarily do that because we may not have a theory on this particular area. <clears throat> and then you, steerly, you clearly state the hypothesis and the purpose of the study. So, if I remember, and I'm going to use, keep using Saunders' paper because it's fresh in my mind, the purpose of the study, therefore, the purpose of the study was to investigate the coordination of people with neoosteoarthritis walking upstairs, something along that. And then we hypothesized that people with neoosteoarthritis would use different coordination patterns than healthy controls. Then you're done with the introduction. But the whole purpose is to capture people's attention. And then you clearly state the hypotheses after the purpose. So, what you're trying to do in the introduction, enable the reader to place your study in context. Provide a rationale for the in, in investigation. Limit the ex, uh, investigation. Okay. What I mean is, don't try to you're, not, you're going to do a specific question. You're not going to go beyond this question. You're going to state the aims, and you're going to state the hypotheses. And if you've done that successfully, okay, the, you will capture the attention of the person reading the paper. Okay. Now, I told you um, before, when I, when I uh, write a paper, the, I guess one of the first things that I do is I write this, just those two sentences, therefore and the hypothesis. Then I write the rest of the paper, and then I come back and do all of this. Okay? So now the methods. This, is the, this should be the easiest part of the paper to write. Because this is what you actually did. 
And it's very uh, formulaic. There's a formula for doing it. So, the formula is, you have a section on participants, what your experimental setup was, all the equipment you used, the protocol, what each subject did, your data analysis, how you analyze the data, and your statistical analysis. The parts where people get mixed up the most in this, and as I said, my students got mixed up, is they mix up the experimental setup and the protocol. So let's go through each one of these. Participants, um, I should mention to you that you know, previously we used subjects, but apparently um, people complained about the term subject. So now we have to use participants. You never use subjects. But you have to describe your IRB procedures. These are your ethics procedures. In every study, you have to submit your study to an ethics board that approves the study. And this is basically to protect your participants. You know, if you said in a study, well, I'm going to cut off some of the fingers of your participant, that's not ethical. And so it would never be approved. Okay. So if you said, I'm going to make the study, the subject or the participant, run for two hours on a treadmill um, in, uh, with a temperature in the room of 40 degrees, that's probably would not be approved. That's not ethical. Okay. So the study has to be approved. <laughs> then you have to describe your participants in detail. Age, height, mass experience at doing whatever you're having them doing. Um, you have to say, were they injured, were they not injured? How you sampled or assigned the subjects to particular groups. Now in biomechanics, this is not usually something that we do. Our subject pool is generally very small. And, you know, so for example, we look for people with neoosteoarthritis. And as many as we can get, we use and we look for healthy controls, people without neoosteoarthritis. So those are your two groups, basically, in that case. And you describe how the, the um, groups were formed, but usually it's just one group has neoosteoarthritis, the other one doesn't. And then if you have any inclusion or exclusion criteria, sometimes in a study like with neoosteoarthritis, um, you know, you want to say, well, the people may have knee osteoarthritis, but you can't use them if uh, they've had uh, surgery, you know, or if they have some neurological issues, or if they were too old, okay, or too young. Those would be exclusion criteria. The inclusion criteria would be that they had knee osteoarthritis and they suffered pain, for example. So, like I said, this is only one paragraph, maybe, maybe four or five sentences at most. Now the experimental setup, this is again very short. All you do is describe your instruments. And what you try to do is describe the limitations of your instruments. And the reliability and validity of your instruments. So, um, you might say, um, we used um, eight cameras to measure the kinematics. Um, we used the force platform to measure the ground reaction forces. It may be as simple as that, just two or three sentences. <clears throat> the protocol now is exactly what each participant did. So the way I write the protocol is I think, well, this is what the participant did from the time they came into the laboratory until the time they left. So you just step through that. Exactly what each subject did in the experiment. Describe the treatment. Describe the length of time. Okay. And the length of time is usually approved by the uh, ethics board. Describe the controls. 
describe the control condition and describe if there were any dropouts. And many times in the studies, you get a subject halfway through the study and then they say, I don't want to do this anymore. And that's fine. You can't force them to do it. And if you're doing studies with children, for example, um, many times you get almost to the end and the, the child decides, I'm not doing this anymore, and you can't do anything. You know, um, and we were doing a study one time uh, with an elderly population, and at the beginning of the, of the protocol, which was a very simple protocol, um, you know, the subject was walking, and he just decided, well, I'm, I'm feeling really faint. So you can't make him continue. So you have to terminate that subject. So you have to describe how many subjects you started with and how many you finished with. Hopefully you don't have too many dropouts. But in the case of you're doing studies with children, you expect a lot of dropouts. Uh, I should say, these are the two things here that my students always have trouble doing. It's very simple, but they have trouble because they want to include the protocol and the experimental setup at the same, uh, at the same time. And it's much easier if you just separate it. Okay? And it's very easy to tell when you read a paper if, this, if the people have and mixed up these two, not mix them up, but you know, uh, merge the two. And you should try and separate them to make things very clear. Now data analysis, well, this is how you got the parameters to do the statistical analysis. And again, you know, you go through step by step. And, you know, while in biomechanics we're, we always love mathematics and we love formula, um, you try not to include formula unless it's absolutely necessary. Um, so, in the data analysis, you might want to say, if they're kinematic data, you might want to say, well, how long you collected the kinematic data? How fast did you collect it? Okay. And then you might want to say, well, how did I treat the kinematic data? Well, I filtered it using this um, at this cutoff, you know, things like that. Um, and I try to limit this whole thing to one paragraph, maybe five or six sentences. In statistical analysis, um, again, you just, um, how, you, how you did the statistics, you know, did you use ANOVA, did you use uh, the design, was it a repeated measures design, or was it a group design? And then, what did you do for post hoc procedures, your level of significance, and did you do effect size? These are all statistical procedures. And I mean, again, in most of my papers, this is you know, two to three sentences. You don't have to be very involved. OK, so that's the method that's very easy to do. Results. And again, the one thing that you have to do in results is never mix up what you do in your discussion with the results. The results are just a reporting of the results. We had statistical significance in these parameters. Okay. These are shown in a figure one. You never want to say what those results mean in this section. You just want to report results. So, you organize the results around the research questions. You have hypotheses. So you report the results based on your hypotheses. And before you do that, you usually present some descriptive statistics. And this is just the means and standard deviations. But sometimes you don't need to. And this is the important thing, is you always present the results most meaningful the least meaningful. Okay. So, if you have three hypotheses, you're going to report on all three. But let's say the third hypothesis was the most meaningful. So you report it first. Okay. 
Um, if you have a large number of statistics, put them in tables. It's, they're easier to read. You don't want to clog up the text of your report with just numbers. And then the key thing is, if you have tables and figures, don't repeat the information in the text. Just refer to the text in, in the report. And you refer to these tables and figures by numbers. You know, and you always do it in the order that they're presented. Figure one is always presented first, figure two next, etc. And the same with tables. And this, this just drives me crazy. Is, are you all familiar with uh, the rule of significant digits? Okay, you can never be more precise than the least precise instrument that you use. Okay. So, for example, you know, in studies I see people saying, um, we measured the ground reaction forces and for this particular uh, group, it was 10.5643210. But you're not that precise. You, in, with ground reaction forces, you're only precise to one place after the decimal. So that would be 10.4. Okay. Kinematic data, you know, with, with really good equipment, you can, you're precise to maybe two decimal places. And I wouldn't even know, EMG, you're precise to one or two, two decimal places. Be very careful about that. I submitted a paper recently, and I was very consistent with my rules for significant digits. And the reviewer said to me, you've got all these different uh, levels of significance, why don't you um, make them all two? Two decimal places. That was actually pretty dumb. And so I wrote back to the reviewer and I said, have you ever heard of the rule of significant digits? And of course the reviewer said, oh, okay, and just dropped it. But, um, you know, it's very important to do this. You never want to get caught up on a, a something very, very simple. Now, a discussion. <coughs> This is the really, really creative part of your paper. This is where, you know, you involve everything that you know about this topic. And as I said, it's the creative part. I always like to study or start the discussion by restating the problem. Okay. And remember, in the last sentence, of, or the last paragraph of your introduction, therefore the purpose of this study was? So I always start the discuss, discussion by saying, the purpose of this study was, okay? Then, that first paragraph of the discussion, I present a summary of my major findings. So, I might say something along the lines of, we had three hypotheses in this study. Two of the hypotheses were confirmed. That is, that I'm in this. One of the hypotheses was only partially supported by the, the data from the study. That's my major findings. Okay? And that should be in the, the first paragraph of the discussion. So, next, what you do you should point out whether the results of the, your study are consistent with the literature that you presented in the introduction. If they're vastly different results, you point that out and you try to give a reason why they're different. If they're the same, that's easy. You know, our results confirm the findings of such and such. And then the next part, and again, as I keep saying, this is the really creative part. You have to interpret your results and offer explanations. So, you had two of your, I'm assuming, that you had two of your hypotheses were confirmed by your results. Why were they confirmed? 
What does it mean that they were confirmed? The other one, the third one, remember, was only partially supported. Why was it only partially supported? And what does it mean that it was only partially supported? Okay? And then, near the end of the discussion, what are the strengths of the study? Okay. And the strengths of the study can be anything along the lines of you used a novel uh, way of analyzing the data, or you did something like um, I used a novel piece of equipment, or, or something along the lines. But then you also try to limit your study. And the limitations are what may have caused the results to be like they were. Okay. And if I use Saunders' study again, um, you know, people, you could say, well, we only went up X number of stairs. We didn't go up a whole staircase. We only went up three stairs? And it was three stairs, three steps. That could be a limitation. Um, you know, another limitation could be um, that you didn't, don't really know what the muscles were doing because you didn't use EMG. Something along those lines. The one thing you do not do is introduce new data. All the data that you have, that's what you discuss. You don't bring in new stuff in the middle of the discussion. And then the last thing in the discussion are what are the implications of this? You know, in, in the case of Saunders' study, the implications are that there's two ways people with neo-osteoarthritis accomplish the same task, and their coordination was different. That's a very, very big finding. Conclusions? And what you do here, and, and again, the mistake that most people make in conclusions is they just reiterate or repeat the results, and you try not to do that. So you try to relate the main findings and aims of the study and the hypotheses. You try to bring everything together. So were the aims of the study realized? What are the main implications of the findings? And this is generally, again, what students do, is they try to be too ambitious. You know, um, in their studies, they might say something along the lines of, um, we found these results and it will solve world peace. You know, that's a tad ambitious. You know. Or, uh, this will mean all uh, subjects will be treated in, in this particular manner. You, you know, you can't say things like that because it's just not true. And this is one of my, one of my pet peeves, is don't discuss what you're going to do in the future. Now, I used to do this in my conclusions. I would say, well, my next study I'm going to do this. And, and usually one study follows another. And what happened was, I put this in, I got sidetracked for a while, and someone else did my study and published it. Okay. So I guess I'm being very greedy in that I don't want to tell people what I'm doing so that they can do what I want to do in the first place. I know that some people like to put in future studies, I just don't. Now, references, it seems like a, a really very simple thing. You know, to list the, uh, the references that you used in the study. But one of the things that you have to do is you have to, the journal that you're submitting to, all journals generally have different ways of presenting their uh, references. Doing a reference list is easy, but you have to pay attention. You don't want a punctuation mark out of place or the name of an author spelled incorrectly. Because people will say, well, if you can't even do the reference list, how, do I, how can I trust the rest of your study? So you have to pay attention. And each journal will specify a method. You look this up, and 
you carefully follow it. So you check all of these things. And again, you only list the papers that you cited in the text. Um, uh, you know, in reviewing a number of papers, you see people will uh, list 40 references. And then you count on the, the text and they only use 25 of them. Why did you list the other 15? That just shows that you weren't very careful. And you have to be very careful. And the last thing that you do before you submit the paper, or before you give the paper to the instructor for grading, is you cross-reference the citations in the manuscript with your reference list. So you go through, say, oh, Jones et al. was in my text. I go to my reference list and make sure Jones et al. is there. So you cross-reference this. And that's all my formula for writing a paper. Most of the things that I've said, um, it's a matter of taking care. Okay. Um, you don't want to appear um, as if you don't care about the paper. You don't want to appear as if you, um, you know, are just sloppy about the paper. You want to be very precise. And as I said, I initially did all of this stuff um, for me, and so that I would write papers. And then some of my students, I kept seeing the same mistakes over and over and over again. And so I would give this to my students and say, read this before you start writing. And then, of course, um, I started giving it in my class because the students were going to submit papers to me in class, and I wanted the things done correctly. As a scientist, you have to be precise. You can't make mistakes. You have to present your work properly. And that's what this whole talk was about. Okay? And for those of you who haven't seen this before, um, this is the University of Massachusetts. Um, this is the nicest time of the year. When I go back home, um, this is what the trees will look like. And that is a mist from the Berkshire Hills in the background. The Berkshire Hills are not mountains, they're hills. Um, this is our <clears throat> one view of the, um, the, let me see, this is the southeast corner of the, the campus. And if you look right about there, you can see the roof of the building where my lab is. Only the roof. And this is our graduate research building. And it actually is very nice campus. Um, so, thank you very much for listening. And do you have any questions? We have time for questions. It's all perfectly clear. There's one there. Okay. Hi. Uh, nice to meet you. My name is Renato. Uh, I have a question. Why you don't like uh, a title like a question? Uh, I guess just a personal preference. Um, I've never used it. I've never done it. And the thing is, I find um, it, it, it repeats, basically, the purpose of the study. And, you know, I mean, while the title should be informative, I just don't like repeating the purpose of the study. It's just a personal preference. I mean, it's perfectly legitimate to use a title as a question. I just don't like it. Thank you. I, I guess it's the same reason I don't like uh, chocolate ice cream. <laughs> Just a personal preference. Joe, uh, I have one. Thank you for.
for your presentation. Uh, as a researcher, you have hundreds of papers published, and also for that, you must have numbers of papers to review. And the first question is, how many do you get to review a month? Second question, how much time do you spend reviewing in average? And the third last question, uh, what makes you to reject a paper at first hand? Um, okay. Let me see. Um, I get a number of requests to review. Um, I probably get maybe two or three a week. They ask to review. I only review maybe one of those um, every two weeks um, because it takes a lot of time. And it takes me, um, you know, I would say on average about five to six hours to review one paper. And um, one of the things that I look for in the paper is basically what I showed here. Is the paper organized? Is the introduction does the introduction logically lead to the question? Are there hypotheses? Are these hypotheses testable? Is the this, this subject group um, well described and identified? Are the experimental setup, is it a good experimental setup to be able to do what they want to do? Um, is the protocol a legitimate protocol? You know, um, and then it just goes through exactly what I have presented here. Does the discussion convince me that what they were trying to do and the results match up? And do they have logical explanations for their results? And of course, then I go through and I check the, the uh, literature. And usually, when you get a paper to review, you're a, a, a so called expert in that field. Um, so you should know the literature based, you know, on your expertise. And if you think that they've used the wrong paper or omitted key papers, um, I will comment on that. And basically, um, I don't like to reject papers the first time I read them. What I like to do is I like to give all of my comments and send them back to the author and see if they can answer the questions that I've posed. If they can't, then you have to reject it. If they can answer them all to your satisfaction, that's fine. The one thing that you should never do um, when you review a paper is just because you disagree with the author does not mean you should reject a paper if their argument is logical. Okay. And um, I know, for example, you know, if you use, do something controversial, and people will say, well, this is just not right. I disagree with this. That, you, that is not a basis for rejecting a paper. But reviewing papers is a voluntary thing, and it takes a lot of time. I mean, if I really wanted to, I could spend 40 hours a week reviewing papers. And that's why I, I only review the papers now that I'm really interested in. So, any other question? Uh, good afternoon, thank you for our presentation. My name is Eleni, I'm a professor here. <coughs> As a professor, I have two important questions. One of them is, how do you go with the errors and difficulties of students? Uh, for instance, here, since the very first year, they are demanded to write and develop pro scientific projects. And uh, it's very difficult to teach them and uh, uh, without doing in their places. This is one of the questions. The other I would like uh, to ask you about uh, authorship and plagiarism. <laughs> Please. Well, the first question is, um, you know, um, well, it's, it's a matter of training. You know, first and second year students, you can't expect them 
to be um, to have brilliant papers right off the bat. They're going to make mistakes. The key thing is what I try to do uh, when I used to teach first and second year students is I would give them something like this, say follow it. And if they don't follow it, I would try to point out where they made a mistake or so. Um, it's a matter of training. You, know, you can't expect them to be perfect the first time through. You can't even expect them to be good the first time through. But ultimately, you know, by third year, you should expect them to improve significantly. And by fourth year, they should be very good at it. Okay? Authorship. <laughs> this is a really good question. Um, authorship, the way I do it in my lab with my graduate students is whoever thought of the study gets the first authorship. And as the if you think of the study and you're going to get the first authorship, you write the first draft of the paper. And then other people who have contributed in terms of the intellectual content of the paper, they just go in order. The last author on the paper is the director of the lab. So in many papers, my name, because I direct the biomechanics lab, and because they're my students that were doing the study, I would be last. Okay. And that's one thing that we try to do right at the beginning. We have a meeting where we say, we're going to do this study. Um, it's your idea. Okay. We'll design the study as a group. You'll write the first draft. All of us will collect the data. And that's done before we do anything. Plagiarism, um, well, um, there are uh, computer programs that will check for plagiarism. And at the University of Massachusetts, uh, all undergraduates, when they submit a paper, are, are submitted online. And when they're submitted online, uh, I forget the name of the program. Uh, it's a computer program that goes through the student's paper and checks for plagiarism. And if there's any, you know, if there's large sections of the paper that come directly from a published paper, the student fails the, um, the assignment. So I don't have to check for it. I know the computer program checks for it. I just get the results of the check. Um, and if there are, is no plagiarism, then I grade the paper. And one of the things that I do, which the students absolutely hate me for, um, which is fine, I grade their English. If, they, if you can't communicate properly, then what good is the report? And so I actually grade English, and then I grade the content as well. Um, so, like I said, I don't actually deal with plagiarism. That's dealt with at a higher level than me as the instructor. Then how I grade it depends completely on me. Does that answer your question? But, I mean, you know, you've hit on two of the biggest problems um, that we have. Authorship and, uh, you know, and uh, plagiarism. And, you know, I used to when I uh, had undergraduates, I do group, have them do group work. And of course, they always list, and you never know who actually did the most work on it. And they all get the same grade. And I thought that wasn't fair. So that's when I said that each individual person will do their own work. There's no group work. So, but, um, I'm glad someone asked that, because that's, those are two huge problems. And I'm not saying I, I uh, the authorship thing, I'm not saying I do it correctly. That's just the way I do it. Other people may do it differently. Any other question? I, I should mention to you, um, I asked a professor to uh, make available a couple of papers. Yes. Um, and you can look at those papers. Those, 
I use two papers of my own because I don't like to criticize other people's papers. Um, and you can see that my papers follow this model very strictly. Yes. Oh, hi again, Joe. Hi. Uh, thank you again for your presentation. Uh, my question is about uh, how we discuss our findings, uh, specifically about how deep in your opinion can we go in speculations? <laughs> how deep can we speculate when we are interpreting our finds? Uh, I'm asking because it's very common uh, uh, to receive uh, comments from reviewers saying, oh, you, it, this is too much speculation, you are not actually measuring this. And in biomechanics, like in motor control, it's very common that we cannot measure the mechanisms, the physiological mechanisms, but uh, if we don't mention what uh, could probably eventually be the, the mechanisms behind it, what we measure from for plates and cameras and so on, I think we are going to... Not, we are not going deep. Uh, speculation sometimes uh, helps other to in the future go, go deeper, okay? Uh, and I think, in my opinion, it's very contrasting because we see, we read some publications that it's all about speculations and sometimes our own speculations are not accepted, we are going to do. So my question is, how do you think, how do you uh, deal with uh, speculations when you write your papers and when you review your student's paper or someone else, someone else's papers when you act as a reviewer? Well, can I start off by what I do? Okay. Um, do you know the story of the three bears? You know, one bear ate too much, one bear ate too little, and the one in the middle was just right? I try to hit the middle, just right. A little bit of speculation, but not a lot. And it's a, a judgment. Uh, a lot of reviewers, some, well, the amount of speculation you can get away with depends upon the reviewer. And it depends, you know, what they think. You know, if, if they think that you're making too much speculation, um, they'll comment on it. And what then comes back, when the paper comes back to you, you have to argue, no, this is not too much speculation. It's warranted. But, like I said, a lot of it just comes down to the reviewer. And I try not to go overboard on speculation, um, but I try to do a little bit. Um, I find students way overboard on speculation. As I said, you know, they try to solve all of the world's problems in their study, and that's not going to happen. Um, an interesting thing, I wrote a paper in 1995, and in the paper, I made a speculation that I really had no evidence for it. It was just a thought that I had. And no one commented on it. But the paper was published. And after that, in the 21 years since then, people have said, why did you speculate this? You know, and I get you know, my paper being commented on by other people, say, this is pure speculation. Why did you do this? And um, so recently, what I did with a couple of my graduate students, we tested the speculation that I made 20 years ago. And the nice thing is it turned out to be right. But like 20 years ago, no one commented on it until after the paper was published. So I just got lucky reviewers, that's all. And sometimes with reviewers, you write really good papers, and the reviewers just hate them. And there's nothing you can do. Sometimes you, read, you write what you consider very poor papers, and the reviewers think they're great, and they get published. And it always mystifies me why my good papers get so much grief and my bad papers get published. Just through luck of the draw. Thank you, Joe. Okay. Tiago? Um, a question from Luis Mochizuki. Yeah. Um, what tips could you give to non-native English language to have more success in writing papers? Well, this is always a, a problem. And um, if I go back 
to the first time I came to Brazil. Um, I went to the uh, Brazilian Society of Biomechanics, and I spent a lot of time listening to uh, many of the uh, talks. And uh, of course, we had translation. And I went around all of the posters, and the thing that I was most taken by was that the work done was really very, very good. It was excellent work. And when I went back home, I was telling people about this, and the people said, well, we never heard of this. You know, we never heard of what Brazil is doing in biomechanics. And of course, the problem is that it's all published in Portuguese. And the unfortunate thing, or fortunate for me, <laughs> is that the language of science is now English, and you have to be good at English. And what I do now is, um, you know, if someone from another country says, I'm not very good at English, but I've tried, can you look at my paper and give me comments? And so I get two or three of these a month from different people, you know, from China, um, from Korea, and actually even some from Europe. And so what I'll do is I'll go through and, you know, I'll basically ed try and edit the paper for them and try to t uh, point out to them where they've gone wrong or where they are right. Um, and eventually the hope is that the person will become more and more fluent in writing papers in English. Um, <coughs> Sandra and I work this way, and actually uh, uh, Ulysses and I uh, have done the same thing. But I've done it for many people, and I just think it's my job, because I'm lucky. I, you know, it's my native language. Um, like for instance, if I tried to write a paper in Portuguese, um, you would probably laugh when I said, if I said it to you, and you would probably go through and correct it all, and eventually I might learn how to write a paper in Portuguese. It's the same process. And the thing is, it's practice. Practice, practice, practice. And it's the same thing in speaking. You know, just speak. Who cares if you make mistakes? You know, um, it, it doesn't matter. You know, eventually, you know, the idea will get across and people will understand you. But if you don't try, You'll never succeed. Okay, and um, it's just a matter, you know, of just go through it. And like I said, there are many people around the world do what I do. They will help you if you ask. If you don't ask, you're not going to get help. So, does that answer your question, Tiago? So, but like I said. If you're, if you're going to do anything at the graduate level, after your undergraduate, um, you're going to have to learn to speak English, whether you like it or not. And um, I know it's difficult. English is a very difficult language to learn. I've been finding out that Portuguese is almost as difficult, but you have to do it. And, and as I said, who cares if you make a mistake? No one. The mistake is not trying. Okay? So. Well, actually, Sandra, maybe Sandra could comment on writing papers. Um, if you give her the microphone. Sandra, what was it like to write a paper in English for the first time? Um, <laughs> I think it's just like you said. Uh, it's, it's a matter of trying and I think it's good to read a lot mm. and get used to, to, to the words mm. and uh, especially in biomechanics uh, you see that many words repeat and here you are getting used to it I think it's very mm. very good way to read a lot mm. I think yeah. um, I work with a number of people in a number of different countries and one of the things that really pleases me is when I see uh, people in these countries uh, writing papers on their own without me having to check them over. Um, I will tell you a story about one of my uh, 
former students, excellent student, and he's now become a very, very prominent researcher in the United States, but he's from China. And he used to write papers, and he would have a thesaurus by him. You know the thesaurus? It gives you words that mean the same thing, but are different. And he was writing a paper, and he wanted to say, we use a force platform. But there are many words that you can substitute in there instead of used. So he looked at his thesaurus and he used a different word. But the different word has a context. So he used a word that means used, but not in the same context. And so he wrote, we consume a force platform. Well, consumed in English means you eat. Okay? So, um, you know, it's a very simple mistake, uh, but he was trying. And, um, and he made many, many similar mistakes, but, you know, eventually now he writes very well. I don't have to, you know, read any of his work. Okay? Thank you very much for listening. Just to finalize, uh, Joe, thank you very much again. Um, I'd like to say something. This is the last uh, lecture from Joe here at this time, till next time, hopefully. And it's common sense that he's one of the best researchers in biomechanics. But there is something even better than that. Sandra was there with him for one year, and there are many or some Brazilian PG students that stayed there with him. And I, I, I had the pleasure to be there for two months. And for two months, uh, Joe Hamel shared his office with me. And I, I was saying thanks for that, Joe. Instead of putting me in another place which would be very nice, he shared his office with me. So this is the kind of person Joe Hamel is. And uh, thank you all for coming and see you very soon. Bye bye. Thank you.